Do you remember the first pair of headphones that you owned? Mine were awkward. They had this thin metal band that I wore around the top of my head that got quite uncomfortable after a relatively short amount of time and could get super hot under direct sunlight. <laughs> Since then, audio design has come leaps and bounds. And now we're on the precipice of another audio revolution, the open ear audio revolution. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Open ear audio can be very beneficial to a host of different applications, including virtual reality headsets, smart glasses, and sports and fitness designs. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Ryan Boyle from Analog Devices and I explore the what, where, and how of open ear audio. We also investigate the solutions that Analog Devices has for open ear audio applications and how you can design open ear audio into your next application. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Analog Devices. Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about audio design for augmented and virtual reality glasses today. But, Ryan, before we dig into the details, what all will we be covering today? Well, that's a great topic to talk about, audio, in particular, open ear audio applications. Open ear audio is kind of a new technology that really came about in the last few years or so, and it's fundamentally this idea that you have audio embedded into the arms of the glasses. And so you're seeing a lot of applications for that, both in augmented reality and in virtual reality, and in audio glasses as well. So I wanted to cover some of the best practices for open ear audio when you're designing these products. There's a lot of maybe smaller startup AR companies, for example, that may have a particular focus. It might be vital signs monitoring for fitness or connected glasses that will help remote technicians finish a job. And these companies might not have a lot of audio expertise. So in the case of communications, it's really important to have good performing audio because that can make a big difference in like the intelligibility of the voice that's talking to you. So having the best electronics to support that is really going to improve the likelihood that everybody is understood on the call, for example. I would like to also cover our consumer audio solutions group and some of the products that we have for this and other consumer audio applications. We're gonna talk a little bit about open ear audio. What is it? What are the different kinds? What are some of the applications and use cases? I'll talk about our amplifier portfolio that is designed for open ear audio and how it can help and how we have some great designs that can help you get to your solution faster. And towards the end, I'm gonna run through a recorded video that I did of a quick tuning of an open ear product using our DSM Sound Studio for the Max 98390. Then I'll recap with a summary and maybe give you some best practices on how to think about audio design with your open ear projects. And I think that's it for today. Fantastic. Now, Analog Devices has a variety of solutions for audio subsystems, right? That's right. We're delivering a lot of great audio solutions for audio subsystems in the consumer market. Smart homes, for example, have a lot of audio products, and we help with that with our plug-and-play solutions. Some of the things that we focus on are high power efficiency, a very, very low noise floor. If you think about a smart speaker, for example, that's right next to your bedside table, you don't want that to be creating any noise. And we also want to be kind of having a really good efficiency so it doesn't drain too much power. We're also a technology behind some of the leading brands in hearables. And we have active noise cancellation codecs, amplifiers for headphones and earbuds. And we have some voice processing algorithms, software that can add to your value on your product. We're also bridging audio in the mixed reality world. So there's a lot of spatial audio, open ear speaker designs that we're currently investigating and providing solutions for. And we'll cover that, of course, today a little bit more. But we're also providing audio for things like tablets and phones and computers where we're kind of optimizing for output power, but also for things like 
efficiency and the most amount of battery that we can get while also producing good sound quality. Fantastic. Okay, so first, Ryan, let's talk about open ear audio. What exactly do you mean by open ear audio? Sure. There's actually a few different kind of examples of open ear audio in the market right now. When we think about open ear audio, it's basically positioning speakers in the arms of glasses kind of right above your ear. If you think about smart glasses or VR headsets, a lot of these products already have embedded speakers in the armbands or in the arms above the glasses. And what that means is that you can listen to sound and music while leaving your ears unblocked from the environment. So a lot of the times this can be a huge benefit for something, for example, like a phone call or for hearing the environment around you and not being totally cut off from what's happening in your environment. There's other solutions such as bone conduction. So bone conduction is a different kind of open ear headphone. And that uses vibrating pads against your head and the vibrations they produce translate into sound. You see those a lot in something like maybe swimming applications where you can actually listen to music while you're swimming. Then there's a third kind of category which is considered called off-ear audio. So some of the higher end virtual reality headsets employ this where they have larger speakers that kind of hover right above your ear. And the benefit for that is you're going to get much more output power and also a higher level of bass than you might on the other forms of open ear audio. And one thing to keep in mind is that sound quality and music playback, it might not be the primary feature of the product, but high fidelity is always going to be important, even though it's a lot more difficult with these constraints of open ear audio. So it's a challenge for acoustic designers and a challenge for product designers to have a good audio solution or sound solution. That makes sense. Now, Ryan, can you walk us through some typical use cases for open ear audio? Of course, augmented glasses would be a perfect use case, right? That's absolutely right. Augmented reality and mixed reality obviously has a lot of potential into the future, and we're seeing that in the market now. And I like to kind of break up open ear audio and its benefits into three different categories. There's augmented or mixed reality. There's something more immersive like virtual reality headsets. And there's something a little bit simpler, which is your smart or audio focused only glasses. And we see examples of all three in the market today. So let me start off with augmented reality. There's a lot of different applications for these. For example, if it's something on the simpler side with maybe a heads up display where you want to have spoken voice instructions, or if it's a little bit more complicated, such as a mixed reality application where the glasses, you're walking around in, in an open environment and you want to see something like, let's say, a dinosaur to interact with at a certain point of interest. You know, maybe it's a game. That dinosaur in this open space, you're going to want to associate the sounds that's coming from that element with the environment around you. So blending seamlessly into the acoustic environment provides a more believable effect. Spatial audio is important here, and open ear audio is a natural fit for that. For virtual reality, that's another area where open ear audio has been implemented. And having speakers directly integrated into the headband is very convenient for the user. Off-ear speakers are used a lot here, but those can be larger and maybe a little bit more complicated. And also keep in mind that the latency has to be very low. So a lot of the times you're not seeing something like a Bluetooth earbud used. In the case of smart or audio glasses, these are growing in popularity for all these different models that are coming into the market. And they focus mostly on music and taking calls, and you see some that are integrated video as well. They might have a wake word access to your virtual assistant or be able to record audio or video. For example, it'd be great to have these always on glasses where you can just ask your virtual assistant what time is it or what's the weather without having to remove your phone or do anything different than you normally would. So if we switch over to what are some of the real compelling reasons to use open ear audio, sports and fitness is a big one. For example, I don't know if it benefits anybody on the call here, but jogging with open ear audio is actually a pretty good experience. It's important to know when there's traffic coming or other obstacles that might be in your way, especially for biking. Biking is a really critical one to not be completely occluded from your environment. And so open ear audio is a very natural fit there. 
in addition, communication is actually a really great experience as well. So if you think about taking phone calls, you're used to using headphones or earbuds, and a lot of the times your ears are blocked a little bit. And so companies get around that by passing through the microphones back into your ears. So that's kind of a little bit of a, a self voice, but you don't have to worry about that at all with open ear audio. You're essentially having a conversation with somebody right next to you, even if they're remote, it just feels like that. So it's a great experience having phone calls and listening to podcasts with open ear audio solutions. Fantastic. Okay. So Ryan, I'm also really intrigued by the virtual reality application here. Can you talk about that in a bit more depth and what challenges is this solution looking to solve? Sure. That's a great question. Virtual reality is gaining a lot of popularity now and you're seeing a lot of virtual reality models adopting open ear audio as their solution. One of the reasons for that is it's a very simple solution. So you don't have to worry about separate headphones or earbuds or wireless products. It really is just built in. And one of the reasons that that is a huge advantage is because of audio latency. So typically wireless earbuds have a little bit of delay associated with them. In order to have a very accurate sound, especially for spatial audio and immersive audio from virtual reality, you have to have low latency. So when you move your head, you have a corresponding move of the audio as well. Open your audio solves that. The other thing is with virtual reality, there can be kind of two different situations. One is you're totally immersed. You want to have no outside world whatsoever, which is great for solo play. But for example, if you're having a shared experience with somebody else, they might be telling you things that they can see on the TV screen or something, or you might be in an environment where you don't feel completely safe by being completely immersed. And having open ear audio allows you to hear things that are happening outside of your play space or your virtual reality session. Some of the challenges though for virtual reality, for open ear audio include not being loud enough, not being immersive enough. You know, sometimes with different games, you might have some challenges behind loudness or bass. Bass is sometimes a little more difficult with open ear form factors. And so the more we do to focus on audio and the more we do to improve the audio performance, the better the experience is going to be for people in virtual reality. Okay, so what about those augmented reality applications? What kind of benefits are we looking at here? The benefits for augmented reality are pretty great, I think, because like I mentioned before, the audio can be blended directly into the environment. You're seeing some really interesting applications coming into the market now with maybe live translations or virtual assistants giving you information. Like I mentioned, taking phone calls is great. Points of interest are interesting. You might have things such as maps and points of interest that you want to explore, but don't discount the always ready sound. So you're always going to have, you know, if a phone call is coming in, you wouldn't even have to take out a phone or put in your earbuds. You don't have to wear earbuds all day if you're wearing something like this. And into the future, there might be much deeper enterprise applications such as factory floors or warehouses where you would need to blend some virtual or mixed reality things into what you're doing and you want to be in a position where you can hear what those instructions might be. So it could be crucially important to hear your surrounding for safety purposes. But there are also some challenges for that as well because you know you want to have a small form factor, you might have battery powered so you want to get the most battery life out of these products. It's also a little difficult to get enough loudness in noisy environments because you're not doing any kind of noise cancellation or noise isolation. So your ears are exposed to the environment that you're in, which in a lot of cases is great, but in this case can be a challenge because you have to provide enough volume or output to get above that noisy environment. That makes sense. Now, Ryan, you also mentioned smart or audio glasses as well. So can we look at that kind of application? Sure. I think there's a huge and short-term benefit for smart and audio glasses. We're seeing a lot of new applications and new products coming out in the market. In the near future, we might see things like limited heads-up displays. You might have smart glasses or audio video glasses that could have you're watching a movie on or playing a game that's tethered to your phone. And these are products that you might be wearing all day anyways. 
I think in 10 years or so, we might see a lot of speakers and microphones integrated into prescription glasses and sunglasses that people are just buying because they have music or they have phone calls or they have podcasts ready to go whenever they want. Maybe you'll also see in the future some more in-depth technologies such as live translations, really, really good access to AI and virtual assistants. But these also have a lot of different requirements. If you're having smart glasses or audio glasses, you're going to want to make sure that they look good. That can be a little bit of a challenge because of the electronics that you're fitting in there. And also speakers take up a little bit of space. So you need to make sure that people are okay with having maybe bigger armbands. And also with the smart glasses or audio glasses, you're going to have to worry about your form factor and being as light as possible, but also having good battery life. So if they're prescription glasses, for example, you're going to want to wear those all day. And if you're running out of battery and you're not able to take phone calls or listen to music, that could be a problem. So efficiency is, is a really crucial part of your audio glasses experience. So based on everything you just said, what specific analog devices, amplifiers, would you suggest for these applications? Well, in the case of open ear speaker systems, we actually at Analog Devices have a wide portfolio of products that fit a lot of different needs. I'll start with our Max 98304, which is a cost-effective analog input amplifier that's used in some current VR headsets. The device features 3.2 watts of output, and it's a very small one millimeter squared package. If we step up to digital input amplifiers, we have a portfolio of those as well. The Max 98361 is a digital plug and play amplifier. And by digital plug and play, it's a technology that analog devices has where it, it acts a lot like an analog input amplifier because you don't need to do any programming. I'll get into that a little bit more. The 98361 and the SSM4567 can also take in eight channel TDM audio. So you could do surround sound. For example, if you wanted to place multiple speakers in each arm on your glasses, you could do that as well. The Max 98390 and the SSM4567 are smart amplifiers, which can deliver a little bit more bass, for example, because they use IV sense. And IV sense is measuring the voltage and the current across the speaker so we can perform better and we can match the speaker characteristics closer so that we can push the speakers a little bit harder. The Max 98390 also features onboard DSP and speaker protection algorithms built in. And I'll cover that a little bit more in a minute. And then finally, we have the Max 98388, which we just started sampling. This is the smallest smart amp in the industry, and it can deliver up to seven watts of output power for deeper bass and more output. Another unique feature is the Max 98388 is layout compatible with the 98361. And since there's a lot of ARV or customers that already are using the 361, it becomes convenient for them to upgrade to the Max 98388 without changing a lot in their layout design. Okay, so can we take a look at that easy to use amplifier, the Max 98361, in the premium version as well? Absolutely. So the Max 98361 is kind of in a class of its own because it takes a digital audio input and doesn't require any complicated I2C programming. And it has a very simple layout to implement what's called tip top. So tip top is tying the inner pins to the outer pins, and it allows you to adjust your gain settings without doing any vias or anything more expensive. The Max 98361 also comes with a one millisecond turn on option. So for example, if you're looking at haptics for controllers or some kind of buzz type of thing that can happen, then this is a great product for that. It also is very good for always on audio. So in the case of an audio sunglasses, when you're getting some phone call randomly or you're trying to do wake word stuff, a virtual assistant, for example, then always on audio and a fast turn on can be great because it stays very efficient, but it also can react very quickly. The Max 98388, which has just been released, extends that by having IV feedback. And IV feedback can extend your bass a little bit it can get higher output levels, and it has speaker protection capabilities. So for two-cell applications, it can output some serious power. Fantastic. So what about the Max 98390? What specific benefits are we looking at for this solution? That's a great question. The Max 98390 is a very unique amplifier. It has a 10-volt boost, so it's able to get a little bit more output 
and it also has a built-in DSP. So this built-in DSP, along with our DSM Sound Studio programming environment, can create, as a result, better bass performance and up to 6 dB more of output than you would without the boost and without dynamic speaker management. So dynamic speaker management is our host of algorithms that can perform better based on our knowledge of the thermal and excursion parameters of the speaker. So if the, we do a laser characterization of the speaker and we can understand exactly how much that speaker is moving and make sure that we're able to maximize the output for that. The Max 98-390 comes with a lot of other functions built in as well, such as dynamic range compression and enhancement, perceptual power reduction, which can help with efficiency, a debuzzer, and EQ filters. And as I'll get into in a minute, you'll see the characterization, tuning, and evaluating the system is quick and easy using our software called DSM Sound Studio. Okay, so let's talk about that DSM Sound Studio. Can you walk us through how this software works? Absolutely. I'd like to show you a recorded video of a very quick tuning that I did using our dynamic speaker management software that comes with the Max 98-390 eval kit called DSM Sound Studio. It can quickly extract parameters and characterize your speaker that you are using for your design. Then you are able to tune the performance of the system. And eventually, you can save everything as a single complete register file that is specific to your system. Let's say, hypothetically, that I am a startup designing a set of AR glasses. I have a great idea for a remote technician troubleshooting product and need to include audio playback for automated spoken instructions. So I need the audio to be loud, but also the device to be small. I don't have any audio expertise, and I want to get a working prototype into the field as fast as possible. And for audio, this can be a little bit of a challenge, but I can very quickly get a solution that sounds better and more clear than the untuned speaker performance using the Max 98-390. So I'd like to cover how quickly you can take some measurements, tune the system, improve the bass, and also get a little bit more power output as well. Once we open up DSM Sound Studio, we're greeted with a few different options. There's the quick demo using reference speaker option where you can hook up the reference speaker that comes with the EV kit, or we can go to characterize and characterize our speaker that we're trying to use for our design. So first thing we do is we play a test track after we ensure that the speaker's hooked up, and we should be able to hear that sound coming from the speaker. And now we're gonna extract our parameters. So if we click the button, we're going to hear a sine sweep playing through the speaker. And you can hear some sound coming from the speaker. What it's trying to do is find a resonant frequency. And there we go. So we have our resonance frequency, our Q, our ambient temperature, which uh, has a sensor that's built into the EV kit. And now we approximate our excursion limits. We do this by turning the volume up a little bit more and more until we start hearing some distortion from the speaker. Then we hear it, turn it down so there's no audible distortion. Now, in this case, we're just going to set a arbitrary thermal limit. This is a specification you want to get from the speaker manufacturer. And we're going to save our protection parameter file. Now, we want to continue to tuning and evaluation. Now that we have characterized our speaker and we've created a protection parameter file, we're going to load those files into the tuning stage and we're going to tune our speaker. So what we have is we have an open ear AR glasses prototype with a microphone that is sitting very close to the output of the speaker, kind of where your ear would be. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna turn on our pink noise generator and you can see that the speaker is responding and we're getting an output. And instantly you can tell that we have kind of a big peak here at 5.7 kilohertz. And so that might be something to do with the acoustics of the enclosure or the grills or the raw transducer itself, but that's not going to sound very good. And what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to try and remove that. And also you can tell that we don't really have a, a significant amount of bass. So this is one of the things that we're going to try and extend. So in the DSM sound studio, we can see that our meters are working. We're far below our excursion limits and our coil temperature is great. No problems there. 
And I will note that although this isn't at the top peak volume level of the speaker, we really just want to be in a linear area for the speaker to make sure that it's not running into any harmonic distortion and it's above the noise level. So first thing we're going to want to do is open our equalizer. And before we do anything else, what we want to do is we actually want to kind of capture this, uh, this raw frequency response. So I'm going to stop here and save this preset. I'm going to hit go again. And now we have a reference. So first thing to do is create a high pass filter so that we know we're protecting the speaker a little bit. You know, it's not, it's a small speaker. We're not going to be able to get any output below these frequencies anyways. So it's just a good, good thing to do. So let's say we have 5,700 Hertz as our center frequency that we want to try and get rid of. And we're going to reduce the gain here. And you can see on the spectrum analyzer that pretty in real time, we're able to kind of lower that and smooth out the frequency response. And what we want is, is a smooth line, which is going to make the vocals a little bit clearer. It's going to make music more natural. And people are just used to not a lot of peaks and valleys in their frequency response. But as you can see, we are kind of affecting some of the frequencies around it. So we're going to make it a little bit, the cue a little bit sharper. And what's great is you can play around with this until you feel like you're getting a good response. And of course, you're going to want to listen. That's, that's the biggest part. But this is a good kind of baseline understanding. We're going to add some more filters here. Maybe see if we can really dial this in a little bit. And maybe we'll add something on the very high end. See if we can get a little bit more high frequencies out of it. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. Okay, so now we're going to stop. Save this preset. Hit OK here. We're going to go again. And let's add some low frequency extension. So we're going to enable the LFX. Let's see if we can lower this down. Let's say 300 and say 350 Hertz or so. Whoa. And then instantly you can see the base has been substantially increased. Let's see if we can boost the gain a little bit. And this is going to jump around a little bit. Maybe let's see if we can mess around with the, the center frequency here. Okay, so at 500 hertz, we've added roughly 14 dB of gain while not affecting anything else. I think that's pretty good. So we're going to stop this one more time. Save it as a preset. Hit OK. And one more note, if we have a battery powered application, we're going to want to enable this PPR, perceptual power reduction. It's not going to affect the, uh, you, you're not going to be able to hear it. There's no perceived quality change, but it's going to save you up to 25% of battery power by removing some areas of frequencies that are below the noise floor. So now that we have, we're feeling pretty good about this. We're going to save our current tuning. Let's call it test three. And within a few minutes, we were able to go from what looked like a pretty irregular frequency response. It wouldn't sound good if you tried it to something a lot flatter with a lot of bass extension. So now that we've got to a tuning that we like and we've saved our current tuning, we want to continue to the listening and evaluation screen. And now our hardware configuration file and protection parameter files have been loaded into this screen and we're able to load up a few different of our tunings to test which one we like better and quickly a b the results to see if we can come to a decision so in this case we have two different test files and we can switch between the two of them you can switch between them with your mouse you can press up and down with your keyboard and the dsm sound studio actually includes an embedded music player where we can load in some sample tracks if we'd like that come with the EV kit and the software. Or you can even use something like a Spotify. 
So after we're done, we just save everything here and we have a complete register file for your product. So just to recap, here's the before and after frequency response of this system. Of course, this is a very quick illustration and you would wanna spend a lot more time tweaking and testing. We focused a little bit more on smoothing out the raw response of the system, but in addition, we might wanna consider an alternate tuning that has a little bit more output, maybe for something like spoken words. But even in just a few minutes, we're able to increase the bass and lower that lower threshold of bass response. So you're going to get maybe an octave or so lower of bass in noticeable ways. One of the great things about DSM Sound Studio is running those ABs to listen to a before and after and turning on and off DSM to see what kind of an improvement in performance you can expect. All right. So when it comes to these hearable applications, does analog devices have any other solutions to help my audience with their next design? Absolutely. We have a wide variety of signal chain solutions and parts that fit a very, very broad spectrum of the different electronics that are needed for AR, VR, and audio or smart glasses. So I won't take too much time to cover all these different options. But for things like power management and battery management, audio codecs, audio amplifiers, there's a lot of different solutions that we have. And you can find more information on analog.com where we have access to these signal chains and you can find more information about individual parts. All right. So Ryan, this was super cool. But before you go, can you recap your main points for me? Absolutely. I would like to just remind some people about some of the considerations that you want to take into account when designing audio for open ear form factors. For example, closer to the ear is better. When you get your speaker closer to your ear, you're going to get a little less leakage. And by that, I mean the amount of sound or audio that people outside of the listener can hear. Maybe if you're on a bus or something like that or walking down a street, you don't necessarily want people to hear your conversation. But also, if you get closer to the ear, you're going to get a little bit better performance, bass in particular, but also you can get away with having a little bit smaller of a solution, a smaller speaker or a smaller amplifier, depending on if you can get it close enough to the ear. One thing to keep in mind is that the amplifiers for open ear audio are typically different from amplifiers for headphones and earbuds. So you need a little bit more output power because you have a much larger volume of space that this audio is pushing into, as opposed to a closed ear cup or a small earbud. So you might want to look at different parts than you might consider for something like an earbud or a headphone. If you can, it's interesting to do two different tunings or two different sets of parameters, one being full fidelity music or gaming, and another being something closer to spoken word, podcasts, phone calls, things like that. If it's spoken word, a lot of people have some trouble with you know, maybe hearing voices above the noise of the environment they're in, or maybe they have mild hearing loss. And if that's the case, getting a little bit more power is good, but at that same time, you also sacrifice a little bit of bass. So it's nice to have two different tunings if you can. In addition, IV sense or having that current and voltage feedback from the speaker itself can maximize the performance of your transducer. And ADI has solutions for that with our algorithms and dynamic speaker management. So if you get one of our amplifiers, there's a really good chance that we can port the algorithm to the SOC or to the DSP that you're using. So in conclusion, Analog Devices has a lot of different audio solutions to help with your design. We have amplifiers, we have DSPs, we have algorithms both on the speaker management side and also on the voice processing side. So we're here to help and we have great support and we'd like to understand what your challenges are and help to solve them. So I just want to end by pointing out some resources. You can contact me at ryan.boyle at analog.com. If you go to analog.com, you can search for our different parts that I mentioned in today's conversation. We do have a product page for dynamic speaker management, and you can find a lot of the different signal chains that we've been talking about if you search. Excellent. Well, Ryan, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me, Amelia. It was great to talk to you. And I'm really excited about audio sunglasses and virtual reality and augmented reality and what can be done for open ear audio. 
And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from analog devices. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.